It's my pleasure to welcome you today uh, to the second installment of Georgia Health Science University's Presidential Lecture Series. I'm Gretchen Kaufman. I'm the EVP and Provost here for any of those who don't know me. Um, again, it's a pleasure to welcome you and I also want to especially say uh, welcome to the students. If you see people munching their lunch back there, it's because they got to get to class after this and so we're very happy that you're here as well. We will have reception after that uh, uh, presentation though for all of us. Um, this series was established to enrich the GHSU experience by inviting distinguished national leaders and scholars to address issues and trends of importance to the academic community in general and to academic health centers in particular. Today I have the honor of introducing you to Dr. Elia Dashi, who will share thoughts with us about President Obama's Global Health Initiative. Um, in reviewing his uh, CV, which is massive, I decided it might be simpler to catalog what Dr. Dashi is not rather than what he is because his accomplishments are so many and varied. I understand he could have joined us yesterday for our noon concert series because he's an accomplished pianist, among other things. So we missed that one, but we'll get him back another time. Um, he is professor of medical science in Brown University's Warren Alpert Medical School, an immediate past dean of medicine and biological sciences at Brown a seasoned physician executive with a keen interest in domestic and international health care. Dr. Dashi is among the many other things, I'll just list a few, an advisor to the World Health Organization, the World Bank, the Rockefeller Foundation, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. He's a member of the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Science and its Board of, on Health Policies, Health Sciences Policy. He's a member of the Association of American Physicians, a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. He's a former Donna Shalala appointee to the National Advisory Council of the Eunice Kennedy Shriver National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. Over the course of his career, Dr. Adashi has co-authored or authored over 250 peer-reviewed publications, more than 120 book chapters and reviews, and 13 books focusing on women's health as well as on ovarian biology and pathology. In our walk over here, he just shared with me that one of the things he really loves most is writing, and I think we can see that from the, the volume of the products of his work. Dr. Adashi also serves as an ad hoc contributor to the Washington Post for op-eds, Medscape, an international web-based medical information outlet for healthcare professionals, Science Progress, which is an online outlet for the Center for American Progress, and as a commentator for Latino Public Radio. We're indeed fortunate to have him here today to share his unique perspectives with us. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Eli Adashi to our community. <laughs> Good afternoon, Dr. Kaufman, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very kindly for this introduction, of course, and not to mention the hospitality over the last 24 hours or so. It has been a whirlwind visit and a lovely one at that. And I want to express my appreciation to all of you who have lent a hand in one way or another to make it hopefully the success that it was intended to be. I consider myself privileged and honored to be involved with this series. I have known some of you uh, for many years. Uh, I have known your current president for some time, and I'm really pleased to see some of the recent developments that transpired all around you, which to me are the harbinger of greater things to come. And thank you really all for joining me today in the midst of an undoubtedly busy day. There really is no such thing as a good, let alone perfect, time for a lecture. We're all too busy to really accommodate such activities. You would be well within your rights uh, if you were to inquire as to what is the President's Global Health Initiative, or GHI for short. And in responding to this uh, rhetoric question, let me simply say that GHI is the first 
ever effort to coalesce the global health portfolio of the United States under one thematic and operational roof. You would think off the cuff that this is a no-brainer, an obvious thing to do, but it has never been done before, and it has yet to achieve the level of perfection that the president intended. But nevertheless, it is a big idea, and hopefully we will come back to that point as we proceed. You would be equally justified to inquire as to the reasons underlying the choice of this topic, and I did struggle with that question. There were several other candidates that perhaps could have qualified, but I ultimately settled on this one for two main reasons. First of all, GHI is an American experiment on a grand scale. You might say that it is a Marshall Plan for global health. And it is, for all practical purposes, the largest global health program, bar none. And we, as citizens, I think, ought to be aware of this initiative. We, as healthcare professionals of one stripe or another, ought to be aware of this initiative, and I might add, be proud of it. Imperfect, work in progress that it is. Mostly, I think GHI is a genuinely big idea, and big ideas make the world go round. For that matter, GHSU is a big idea. And as you embark on your future, there may be some lessons that can be learned from an experience on a much broader scale in a very different context, but nevertheless, one that might be applicable to many and really a broad range of institutions. Secondly, GHI is a remarkable case study of what I would call aspirational human endeavor. It is replete with challenges, as I've already alluded to, but it is rife with lessons for any organization, large and small, be it a university, be it a health sciences center, be it an institute or a program, for that matter, a department or a division, and for that matter, I would say any collective human enterprise. The universal nature of this particular statement draws on the fact that the GHI, not unlike other big ideas, has to reconcile I would say harness the prototypical enterprise constraining attributes which are part of human nature, namely individuality and territoriality, with a set of enterprise sustaining attributes such as cooperation, communication, coordination, collaboration, and consolidation, all of which are essential if a big idea is to fly. And it, it is in that spirit that GHI is being discussed today because it is about how or how not to put big ideas to work and about understanding the forces that will either make or break such an undertaking. As such, uh, this particular story begins uh, on May 5, 2009, barely four months 
after the president's inauguration. As is customary in such cases, a statement was issued by the White House Office of the Press Secretary. And in it, the president is quoted as saying, I am asking Congress for $63 billion over six years to shape a new comprehensive global health strategy. What I want to see, and I'm filling in the blanks, is an integrated approach to global health replete with nothing but the best practices. Translation, we have operational challenges. What the president didn't say is that our strategy is not comprehensive and our approach is neither integrated nor marked by best practices. The president is further quoted as saying that we need to do more to improve health systems and focus our efforts on child and maternal health. Translation, we also have programmatic challenges. In a word, not enough is being done to strengthen health systems, and too little light is being shown on child and maternal health. Such subliminal messaging is indeed quite prevalent in government speak as it turns out. Therefore, we can safely assume that there was much the president was well aware of, but chose not to say. That is the art of the presidency, and that is the art of governing. To that, I am taking the liberty of adding the following, because there was much more that was never quite articulated. We can safely surmise, although we are second-guessing the president, that he could have said, ours is a fragmented aid system. You might say a stovepiped enterprise that is marked by vertical disease-specific initiatives for AIDS, for malaria, for tuberculosis, and never shall the twain meet. Marked by a multiplicity of agencies and programs, disparate funding streams, nominal interagency coordination and planning, and limited strategic synergies. If you see some similarities here to your daily life, and to the organization you may be affiliated with, that is exactly the intent of today's discussion. The president likewise chose to stay mum on the fact that ours is an outdated aid system that makes limited use of monitoring and evaluation, pays insufficient attention to so-called return on investment, and spends too much time on process and too little on outcomes. These are truisms that the development community has long accepted and that we as a nation, I think by now, have embraced, but have had to incorporate into an all-inclusive program such as the GHI. Lastly, and not insignificantly, the president could have been second-guessed to say that ours is an unbalanced aid system which pays limited attention to neglected tropical diseases, a huge opportunity to help mankind that has been left in the background for way too long. And as the record shows, we likely are guilty of stagnant support to family planning and to reproductive health over the years, which, and I'm speaking for the president now, would like to see corrected. 
But enough of that. That was what actually happened on May the 9th and what actually didn't happen on May the 9th. But for anybody who is anywhere near this scene, that was all self-evident. It was a full nine months after that announcement that the State Department released the first relevant strategic document titled Implementation Consultation Document. Not unlike some of the strategic documents you undoubtedly distribute to all stakeholders in the hope of, first of all, sharing, but also in the hope of receiving feedback, correcting, adjusting, improving as you go. And that was precisely the intent here. As such, this document set out for the first time very ambitious targets, delineated rather demanding goals, and enunciated various rather lofty principles. The stated targets of the GHI divided in this slide into communicable and non-communicable diseases are shown here. In the communicable disease column, special note is made yet again of the so-called NTDs, or neglected tropical diseases, which have heretofore been all but marginalized. In the so-called NCD, or non-communicable diseases column, and this has become a huge issue to humanity just in the last week, when the United Nations held a special high-level meeting dedicated to nothing but non-communicable diseases. Maternal, newborn, and child health, family planning and reproductive health and nutrition are accompanied by a relative newcomer, namely health system strengthening. The recognition that we can pour as much money as we can possibly muster but that without creating the infrastructure of the healthcare system in the countries we seek to assist, we are not likely to be successful either in the short term, let alone in the long term. The stated goals of the GHI in turn focused on three of the so-called eight millennium development goals, which is a benchmark set up by the United Nations back in the year 2000, and which was to reach a certain climax, as it will, in the year 2015, at which time some very set goals are to be accomplished. And the GHI only picks three of the eight Millennium Development Goals. They are substantial enough uh, and therefore quite demanding uh, focusing on child mortality, maternal health and mortality, and of course, HIV, AIDS, malaria, and some other communicable diseases. Lastly, the principles enunciated by the GHI placed squarely gender equality front and center to be followed by generally accepted, if more conventional, operational precepts. For example, country ownership, a well-known principle at this time, subscribes to the view that in post-colonial times, it is not up to us to dictate to the countries we assist what their agenda can or should be. Rather, we let them own the program, work with them, advise them, support them, partner with them, and thereby hopefully maximize our input. Partnerships, just by way of example, simply reflects the fact that nobody, including this great nation, can go it alone. The job's just too big, and the resources required just too immense. And we are pouring a great deal of resources into this effort and others, and it is not enough, and it must be clear 
that we need to work with others on the same issues. This initial implementation consultation document also introduced for the first time the concept of GHI plus countries, of which there are to be up to 20 in the final analysis. Those countries, once selected, are to constitute so-called fast-track learning laboratories in which hopefully many of the lessons, mistakes, any productive information that can be derived could then be translated and extended to other countries. An effort which was to begin in 2011 and to entail some additional extra technical and operational support to the countries in question. As expected, and indeed only four months later, the first round of eight GHI plus countries was announced. And as you can see, those are spread over three continents, Asia, Africa, and South America. And those GHI plus countries that were selected collectively are home to about 25% of the GHI country spending, which makes them already pioneers or leading edge, which hopefully would facilitate the implementation of the GHI agenda. These GHI plus countries are also home to a significant number of GHI programs, a term we have previously not used. I refer to them as targets, but those are one and the same. Above and beyond these developments, calendar year 2010 saw the GHI declared key to United States national security and development policy by three distinct instruments. First to be released was the President's National Security Strategy in which GHI was declared a component of promoting dignity by meeting basic needs. Second, and that was followed uh, by uh, the Presidential Policy Directive on Global Development, in which it was stated that GHI is one of three global initiatives, the other two being the Global Climate Change Initiative and the Global Food Security Initiative. Rounding up the series was the Quadrennial Diplomacy and Development Review of the State Department in which GHI was declared one of the key six areas of development. Finally, and by now two years after the launch of the GHI, the revised strategy document was finally released. Though still long on platitudes and short on specifics, as strategic documents sometimes tend to be, the GHI strategy document nevertheless did close a loop and GHI, I would say, finally was truly underway. As we move the discussion to the present, let us begin by answering the question, who are the actors involved in GHI? In other words, which governmental entities take part in this effort? In the main, and is shown here, the actors include the White House, of course, the Department of State, the U.S. Agency for International Development, or USAID in brief, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, or PEPFAR, and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or CDC for short. Note that two of the leading agencies, USAID and PEPFAR, report to the Department of State. 
whereas the CDC reports to the Department of Health and Human Services. As such, the lead table is set for three major agencies and two key departments. If you can foresee the challenges that this arrangement introduces, I think here again you might see some of the realities that surround all of us every day. Against that backdrop, it is no less important to respond to the follow-up question, namely, who's in charge? The answer to which, unfortunately, is at this time, nobody and everybody, for reasons that will soon become apparent. In this paradigm, known as, quote, whole of government, end quote, or as I would call it, governance by committee, no agency has been singled out to lead at this time. And so we are left with the management of this contrast, construct in the hands of a GHI executive director who reports to the Deputy Secretary of State for Management and Resources, who in turn reports to the Secretary of State and of course to the White House, and in a sense works closely with the so-called GHI Operations Committee, which is represented by the lead individuals of USAID, PEPFAR, and CDC, or designates thereof. They, in turn, seek further input from a GHI strategic council that includes a number of departments we haven't discussed so far, such as the Department of the Treasury, the Department of Defense, and agencies that have also not been mentioned thus far, such as the Peace Corps. It is a complicated construct to which we will come back later but which is expected to lead a complicated organization such as the GHI. In country, because we are not just discussing DC here, we are discussing what happens in countries in which we are trying to provide assistance. I would say by contrast, GHI's leadership may be somewhat better defined. In this context, it is the U.S. ambassador or chief of mission who is designated as the lead to oversee so-called in-country U.S. agencies. He or she reports, of course, to the Secretary of State, but has the authority empowered and entrusted with him or her to oversee in-country agencies which we have mentioned before. The challenges of governments notwithstanding, to which we will return, what is it, you might ask, that the GHI actually does? And I think that's obviously central and will be dealt with in the next set of slides. Importantly, and these are headlines, but I think the key elements of the effort. GHI is serving over 70 low and middle income countries around the world. It is largely invested in the African continent to which it devotes about 84% of its resources. It is primarily focused on communicable diseases to which, again, something like 84% of the resources are dedicated, and only secondarily focused on family planning, reproductive health, maternal, newborn, and child health, and nutrition, which receive essentially the remaining 13% of the resources. GHI programs vary across countries. Not every single country amongst those 72 countries, in effect, receives the same kind of support. Twelve countries are home to six GHI programs, that is to say six 
targets are being addressed. 40 countries are home to three or more such programs, but 20 countries are home to just one GHI program, which documents the heterogeneity of the effort across the globe. This latter point is perhaps best illustrated by GHI's global footprint. Please note the focus on Africa and the Indian subcontinent, with far more limited presence in the Middle East and in the wide expanses of Asia and South America. Regrettably, for GHI, for many other good causes, the world in 2011 is a very different place than it was even in 2009, which could hardly be described as a model of economic prosperity. But in hindsight, one wonders, and that's a luxury, whether GHI was too big for its breaches. It certainly is facing a very different reality today, and it may have to go through a certain curtailment. Second guessing aside and looking ahead instead, GHI may well be facing spending cuts of yet unknown magnitude. Not surprisingly, as you can see in this slide, the budget of fiscal year 11 was enacted at a level approximating fiscal year 10, and we don't expect fiscal year 12 to fare any better. In fact, we expect it will fare much worse. These realities, now compounded by the recently enacted Budget Control Act of 2011, with its mandatory built-in cuts, call into question the feasibility of actually realizing GHI's hoped-for appropriation of $63 billion over a six-year interval as originally envisioned. Even if the President's fiscal year 12 budget request is enacted as is, which is highly unlikely, the final two budget cycles, fiscal year 13 and 14, as is shown here, would require that the President request and Congress appropriate a total of $27 billion. That, too, is deemed highly unlikely and is further confounded by the outcome of the congressional and presidential elections of 2012. More likely than not, GHI will need to adapt to a more constrained resource pool. The doom and gloom notwithstanding, GHI is not without redeeming points of light, and I mentioned some of them before. It is barely two years young, so we are perhaps asking a lot from a relatively young program. Many of us still feel strongly that it is conceptually sound, that it is aspirational and inspirational. As a matter of record, it is the world's leading global health program, is undoubtedly key to U.S. national security, and as we speak at least, is serving over 70 low- and middle-income countries. That said, significant, indeed, multiple concerns remain a partial listing of which includes concerns about GHI's unconsolidated funding stream, which we will come back to in a minute, its unaffordable or likely unaffordable geographic reach and its unbalanced focus. In addition, there are concerns about its programmatic focus that could well be unaffordable as well, and as we have seen, heterogeneous in its coverage. Additional concerns revolve around GHI's distributive central governance, 
It's yet to be accomplished integration at the point of care level of health delivery. It's reluctance to partner with other donors. It's insufficient attention to women and to NTDs. And it's absent role thus far in the NCD crisis that it can hardly afford to ignore. This latter point appears particularly significant and as such may deserve some expansion in the event that time permits at the end of this presentation. All told, there are some significant take-home points that I wanted to share with you. GHI constitutes a well-meant, if imperfect, paradigm. We are now at the midway point, and we may have to say that progress has been uneven and unbalanced. Even more so, it is possible, and some have argued, that the title has not actually lived up to its promises and that we are not necessarily dealing with a global health initiative, but that we are dealing with an African communicable disease initiative with the other targets being somewhat marginalized. In addition, it is possible that Marshall plans may no longer be affordable. We hear this right and left. Similar admonition applies to any and all institutions contemplating major new programs and new expansions. We are looking at a significant contraction at the level of research support. We are looking at an almost certain major contraction in healthcare support and reimbursement from a public point of view. And so every new initiative must be weighed carefully and considered against this, at this point, less than optimal backdrop. We've also observed on many occasions that the ship of state is hard to steer and turn although I think we can all agree that some smaller ships perhaps are equally difficult to steer and turn. Never overestimate or underestimate the amount of change which can be accomplished and the speed with which such change might in fact transpire. To many of us who have been observing this effort, the following point appears inevitable. Single identifiable empowered leadership is key. You might say that leadership is not a team sport. Whole of government is probably not a solution. Somebody needs to make a decision and others including the leadership, must be accountable. Single centrally managed bottom line is likewise indispensable if programmatic reallocations are ever to be realized. Non-fungible, distinct funding streams, as is the case for GHI, which will be very hard to change, are a significant burden on the flexibility of the program and its ability to move from its heavy focus on communicable diseases, for example, to non-communicable diseases, as we have outlined. And finally, partnering is key. No one can or should go it alone, including great nations such as this. It is essential that our program that is currently 85% bilateral, which is to say emphasizes the exclusive relationship between us and the recipients, and 15% multilateral, which is to say in partnership with other global donors, needs to be adjusted 
such that a greater proportion of our support ends up in global pools, the presumption, of course, being that those are responsibly managed, etc., and that those pooled resources, globally speaking, can then hopefully begin to approximate the huge needs that are otherwise unmet there. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to end here so as to leave some time for questions. I hope that by describing a program that might be foreign to some of you, might, might, might have implications to everybody's concern, will serve you in some fashion as you plot your future, your big idea, and as you put this big idea into play. You will probably have noticed in my own analysis and tone that while I am a great fan of the GHI and a great supporter thereof, I am concerned about its prospects. I'm concerned about its execution and implementation. And I'm concerned that we, not, we are not perhaps delivering or matching, shall we say, the rhetoric with the outcome. That's not to be confused with the great passion that I feel towards this program and the one that you must feel towards this place. But I think it is equally important to look with open eyes at some of these big initiatives, big ideas, try to point out its relative shortcomings in a constructive fashion and work collectively to improve them as we go forward. Thank you very much for the opportunity. It's a very interesting and very important uh, presentation. And, and indeed, this is a major initiative, and we should all uh, learn about it, and we should all uh, consider that as we are unfolding our new, initiati or new initiatives. Um, I have a question in connection with the impact of this initiative, or the potential impact. And as you look at the list of countries that you uh, mentioned, uh, they may look homogeneous from here, but actually most of them are loaded with minorities that are marginalized in many ways, and they are marginalized in terms of health status and access to health resources. So my question is that uh, this Global Health Initiative, will this consider uh, the dangers of further marginalization? Will it help to limit that and improve overall health status results on an equitable and fair way? Point very well taken. If I may paraphrase what I think you are saying is that, of course, whatever we do cannot be a standardized cookie-cutter approach to each and every country. And the solution that the GHI settled on is to develop country-specific plans. If you actually go on the GHI website, you will see some very specific plans for each country that is being evaluated at this point, mostly in the context of GHI plus countries. Is this a perfect undertaking at this time? Does it take into account the fine demography of the nations in question I'm not sure I'm even in a position to address. But remember, we have underground presence in many of these countries. There could be a US aid mission on site. Uh, there obviously would be an, either an embassy or a mission on site. 
There may be a CDC outpost on site. And so it's not as if we are entirely devoid of insights into the workings of the countries in question. I intuitively sense, and I'm not in a position to document this or refute this one way or the other, that these elements have and must have been taken into account in the construction of the country-specific plans, which are consultative processes over month on end between U.S. agencies and the country ownership. I know there is a well-meaning, serious intent to live up to these principles. How well we deliver is always a little more difficult to assess, but the intent is there, and I believe whatever we see is a sea of change in that regard and a market improvement over the way we used to go about that business. Thank you for your comment. Thank you for a very interesting and provocative presentation. Uh, my, my question has to do with, has there been any attempt to coordinate with the various international charitable foundations um, which um, seem like they're trying to address many of the same issues that you, you've mentioned? Yes, and thank you for highlighting that. I was alluding to this tangentially when I was speaking about the bilaterality versus the multilaterality. Um, we contribute some to international charities. I mean, not insignificantly, I should say. All I think I was saying was we could do better. For example, we put a billion dollars a year into the global fund. That's a great deal of money that comes out of the PEPFAR line of appropriation. It is one-eighth or one-ninth of the budget of the Global Fund. We give $50 million a year if Congress will continue, will be true to the commitment to UNFPA, which is a UN agency concerned with family planning in particular. That constitutes 10% of that agency's $500 million budget. We give additional funds to Gavi, which is the international organization concerned with the development of a vaccine for HIV AIDS. And there are some other examples. When we add all of those up, it's about 15% of the budget of the GHI. 85% is dedicated to bilateral efforts, whereby we interact with the recipient directly. And we do so with some logic behind it, in the sense that we want to, in a way, be recognized for the efforts we invest. Uh, there are hopefully some goodwill returns uh, when the relationship is bilateral. And when it comes to legislators, they are very keen on demonstrating to themselves and to their constituencies that taxpayers' money, taxpayer funds, are being spent in a way that is accountable in a given country as opposed to sinking into a large pool that is then difficult to account for. That's a maturation process I think everybody is going through and struggling with. There's always going to be some bilateral assistance, almost certainly. The point we're arguing, some of us, including me, is that the days of going it alone, uh, and that's not just true for the United States, uh, are probably in need of some revision with the needle moving towards multilateralism or a greater degree of multilateralism compared to where we are today. Thank you for making that point. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Dashi. Uh, thank you. Uh, Ricardo had envisaged this lecture series as having <laughs> eminent scholars come and uh, broaden our minds and give us a global perspective, and so you uh, achieved that handsomely. Thank okay. you. I have two questions. One is related 
to you said, of course, that the uh, programs are mightily influenced by the current financial uh, 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 entrenchment that we find ourselves in, but I'm wondering also how much these relate to the ebb and flow and the kind of legacy aspirations of individual presidents. Uh, so yesterday, for instance, I received notice from the Carter Center that after 23 years of good effort, they had declared the Guinea worm extinct in uh, New Guinea, mm -hmm. or in Ghana. And, and so obviously, uh, President uh, Carter had this foremost in his mind and has continued that after his presidency. How much of this initiative is influenced upwards or downwards or in actual direction by individual presidents? And then my second question is, it, could you just illuminate a little bit more about the role of WHO and how how does America relate to WHO and global health, and is it like the UN, or, or, or what your thoughts on that are, please? So I may want to break this up, if I may, into three uh, questions. Uh, first of all, uh, I think with respect to the issue of uh, funding and support, uh, you know as well as anybody in this room that the President's desires notwithstanding Appropriation is the responsibility and the power of Congress and really much depends on how they perceive our overall financial situation and the level of enthusiasm and excitement they have about foreign aid. That too is on the table right now as we tend to look inwards and as our concerns are inwards Arguments that in good times may not be as powerful um, that have to do with the fact that it's not as if our nation is devoid of poverty or devoid of unemployment or devoid of many challenging issues. And is this really the time uh, to expand or even maintain our support to other nations? So a degree of isolationism sets in in times of hardship. And I think that's part of the mix right now. With respect to the president's role, there clearly is a matter of legacy, although I wouldn't overplay it. What Carter did with the efforts uh, uh, that you described uh, is obviously a post-presidency effort of his and is a remarkable and commendable effort that he stuck to, uh, mobilized the funds for, and served as a spokesman for. And so I have nothing but the highest respect for that effort, but I would not call it a presidential legacy as much as I would call it a post-presidential legacy. President Bush uh, clearly left a lasting legacy with the PEPFAR program and the robust re response of the United States to the international AIDS epidemic at a time when uh, bipartisanship was not exactly uh, a whole lot better than it is today. But nevertheless, everybody came together around that idea. And I think for the most part still supports it. That view being now somewhat clouded and modified by the financial situation. The president, by the way, continues his efforts in this arena in a big way through his presidential library and institute. And uh, there are multiple initiatives that have only occurred in the last several weeks in which President Bush's efforts have been uni united with efforts of the current administration, particularly in areas such as cervical cancer and others. Clearly, Mr. Obama wanted to put his uh, signature on the global health scene. He recognized in his statement and repeatedly thereafter, as did the Secretary of State, the legacy of President Bush, but wanted to build on it and in a sense integrated PEPFAR into a broader construct which we refer to as the GHI. 
the PEPFAR funding stream, the PEPFAR concept, the PEPFAR construct was left untouched, but was incorporated into a bigger construct, which was probably the president's greatest contribution. He and the program, unfortunately, are running into some significant implementational challenges, but that does not in any way diminish from what I still think is a great idea, which is where we started. Big idea, and it is a big idea indeed, which took maturing concepts in foreign aid and incorporated them into a package, the likes of which we simply haven't seen before. Some of it will transpire, some of it may not, other presidents will follow, none of us was given the gift of prophecy. So progress is perhaps piecemeal and stuttery, but progress is being made. I believe that answers uh, uh, the, the World of Health, WHO yes, and yes. How sorry about that, relations. yes. The World Health Organization in the context of GHI does not play a direct role. Yeah. I mean, the, the WHO is an incredibly important health organ that mostly engages in establishing norms and guidelines and makes well thought out evidence-based recommendations on a whole host of issues related to health. The WHO did, however, become probably the lead actor in putting on the world stage the non-communicable disease crisis, which kills more people than communicable diseases and which constitutes the primary care challenge of the 21st century with huge economic impact, with huge health impact, and it's no longer the disease of affluent countries. It's the disease of the entire globe. And if we don't do something about it by way of prevention and some relatively straightforward modification of various risk factors, uh, we're going to pay a dear price as a universe. So WHO has not really been a major actor in GHI but it deserves a great deal of credit for decade-long efforts to bring the NCDs onto the world stage, which culminated last week, or maybe it was the beginning of a long process, but culminated last week with the general UN Assembly taking this up as a special summit and making a political declaration at the end with multiple commitments albeit no funding, which you might expect at this stage. So WHO, while critical in a whole host of ways, has not been a major actor in GHI. Um, Hopefully very short. Um, what a privilege and honor to be here for this hour. I'm with the Alzheimer's Association and cannot thank GHSU enough for inviting us. How informative. Dr. Kaufman, in her intro, um, mentioned your affiliation with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And my thought process as I was listening to your wonderful words is on a global scale, are we not going to have to have the partnerships, the private partnerships? I think of the uh, Melinda and their, the Gates Foundation, their commitment to Rotary International, and how we now have seen polio, uh, only I believe four countries now have been since of polio. So will it not take on that global initiative the private partnerships that we're gonna have to see? Point well taken, well said too. This is a development as everybody in this room know, knows of more or less the last decade when some remarkable philanthropists stepped forward and, in a sense, committed their personal fortunes to the betterment of mankind. And the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, probably is the most shining example, but by no means the only one, and we hope that many 
will follow. Um, they are partners, but they are not, um, shall we say, operating necessarily under the governmental umbrella and or in coordination with the governmental umbrella. The Gateses have every right to determine what priorities they wish to pursue. And on the global scene, and they obviously pursue domestic goals as well, but on the domestic uh, platform, they choose to pursue polio and many other important initiatives. I mostly got involved in it in the context of their commitment to women health and to maternal mortality in particular, which is incredibly high, uh, accounting for, as recent numbers would indicate, 350,000 women dying in childbirth every year. So yes, I think it is a partnership of sorts in the sense that we are all operating in parallel to alleviate suffering and to improve the lot of our fellow men and women, but it's not a coordinated partnership. They do their thing and the government does their thing. That's not necessarily duplicative and that's not necessarily counterproductive, but it is, in this case, it's not a partnership, it's a parallelship perhaps, if I were to coin a term on the fly. And that probably is true for some of the other smaller philanthropies. Uh, will there be a day when the fortunes of um, an estate such as the Gates estate or others would actually work hand in hand in the planning and execution of global programs? Perhaps, but that is not the reality today. Once again, Dr. Dreyfus, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.